Welcome today, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Hovar Birkovic and excuse me, Birkovic, and he'll be telling us about stabilizing a multi-parameter module decomposition. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, the time was actually good because just a few weeks ago I put out a paper on archive, so feel free to check out that. And that's essentially what I'm going to present here. So the topic is multi-parameter persistence, um, specifically decomposition of multi-parameter modules and whether this is stable or if we can make it stable. Um, so I'm not going to give you the precise definition of a persistence module, but I've drawn a two-parameter module here. So you can have an idea of what it is if you haven't already seen them. So a two-parameter module is um, a collection of vector spaces in the plane. So two parameters because we're in R2. And we have morphisms, so linear transformations going to the right and upwards and diagonally upwards. And we have a requirement that if you take some path going from one point to another and you compose the linear transformations, then you should get the same result as if you chose any other path and compose. Um, the, um, the morphisms. So you can view this as one gigantic commutative diagram if you want. And we also have morphisms between modules. Um, these are defined just pointwise. So you have a uh, morphism from the vector space at one point to the vector space at another point, uh, sorry, at the same point in the other module. And again, we require that everything commutes. And with these objects, the modules and these morphisms, we get a category of, in this case, two parameter modules. And this is even an abelian category. So we have kernels and co-kernels and direct sums and the algebra is uh, really nice. So um, yeah, we have a category of one parameter modules and two parameter and three parameter and so on. And the results that I'm gonna talk about here are, um, mostly valid uh, well some are in the specific one parameter case but the rest is for general multi-parameter modules for any number of parameters um, but i'm mostly going to talk about one and two parameter modules because most of the phenomena that we see and are interesting interested in um, occur already in these uh, low dimensional cases okay so we're talking about uh, decompositions and we have this nice theorem here um, which says that we essentially have unique decomposition into uh, indecomposable modules. So to be precise, if you take some module A and then you write this as a direct sum, well, first of all, you can write this as a direct sum of indecomposable modules. And once you've done this, uh, or if you do this in two different ways, then you can always find a bijection between the two sets of indecomposable modules that we get. Um, such that you, you match together isomorphic modules. So this means that we can define um, a barcode um, of a module. This is inspired by the one, uh, the name barcode is inspired by the one parameter case. And this is just a set of modules defined up to isomorphisms. Um, so this barcode is well-defined by this uh, theorem here. And in the one parameter setting, we have something even nicer because then we know that the, the barcode only uh, contains what's called interval modules, which are particularly nice. So if we have a one parameter module, which I've uh, roughly sketched here, so it lives along a line and you can imagine that we have something zero dimensional then one dimensional and two and one and two and one and zero, then we can always find a way to uh, write this as a direct sum of these interval modules. So an interval module in the one parameter case is just um, supported on an interval outside it's zero and inside the interval we have um, one dimensional vector spaces and you can imagine isomorphisms or identity morphisms in between them. So these interval modules they're um, up to isomorphism they're uniquely defined by their support so you can just view them um, as intervals, essentially. So this means that in um, one parameter, we have this nice pipeline. We have a module, which we can assume comes from some sort of data set. And then we can decompose, them, decompose the module into this um, 
set of uh, interval modules. And this way, we instead of having this complicated algebraic object, we just have a set of intervals, which is um, very nice. We can visualize it, and we can draw the persistence diagram, and it's easier to write algorithms for many small pieces. And we get a lot of uh, advantages out of this. And this is, um, I guess, a big reason why one parameter persistence is, uh, is successful and why it's used a lot. And um, whenever we have such a pipeline like this, there is an important question of whether this is stable. So if you start out with two modules that are uh, similar to each other, you can imagine that uh, one is just the other with a little bit of noise on top then do we actually get two similar barcodes out of this? And the answer is yes, uh, as this theorem says. Um, so if we have two one-parameter modules and they're similar to, to each other, by which we mean that they're epsilon interleaved, then we can find an epsilon matching between their barcodes. So this epsilon matching this, um, um, says essentially that these barcodes are similar. Um, and um, an epsilon matching looks something like this. Here we have two modules and their barcodes. Then for an epsilon matching, we're allowed to throw out some uh, small bars if we want, but then what we're left with, we should find um, a bijection between the two um, sets that are left. And we are only allowed to match bars that are similar. So their endpoints aren't too far away. Um, so in one parameter persistence, everything is very nice. We have this unique decomposition, the inner are simple and we have stability. And then we can ask, is the same true for multi-parameter persistence, uh, which I'm, uh, is one of my fields of interest. And there are good reasons why in some cases we would, would want to look at multi-parameter modules instead of uh, single parameter modules. So I'm not gonna go into the, whole motivation for multi-persistence uh, now. Um, unfortunately, things are not so good in the multi-parameter setting. Um, we do have this uh, unique decomposition into indecomposables. The theorem that I stated earlier is valid also in this case. But when we start to look for matchings, um, things are not well behaved. Um, so there's a recent theorem by Bauer and Skokula, which says that if you have some module A, could be any module, then even if this consists of a lot of separate pieces and it's a direct sum of many um, indecomposable modules, then we can still always find uh, a module arbitrarily close to this module that's indecomposable. And this is a problem for finding matchings because if you have a lot of uh, summons on one side, then you also want a lot of summons in the other module to be able to find a good matching. But if the other module is just indecomposable, so it has one summoned, then you're not going to be able to find a good matching in many cases. Um, and, you know, we could just stop the story here. We have everything is nice in one parameter. We have uh, stability in everything. And then in multi-parameter, we don't have stability, as this theorem says. Um, but if you start to look at the examples, then you see that maybe this doesn't quite tell you everything. Because if you look at the examples in the paper that I'm citing here, and also some other examples, like this is inspired by an example by Botnan and Lesnik from another paper, you see that what often happens, and the reason why you can't find these good matchings, is that you might have two modules like A and B here that look like they're essentially, uh, in this case, just three squares that are um, separate from each other. But then you have these small pieces here, these small bridges that uh, glue together some indecomposables. And now when we look for a matching here, we have this indecomposable I, and we have to match that to either J or J prime in the barcode of B. And it's not similar to J and it's not similar to J prime. So we don't have a good matching, but we see that I is really just two squares. So we feel, I feel like we should be able to be allowed to sort of break it apart and consider this case instead. So now I've replaced A and B with uh, some sort of approximation of A and B.
Um, so this leads us to the idea of, okay, maybe we don't have good matchings on the nose, but maybe we should first try to approximate the modules, split them apart somehow, and then uh, start to match. So maybe this could be a stable operation. Um, and that leads us to um, an idea for the multi-parameter pipeline. So instead of going from a module and then directly to a decomposition, maybe we should first try to sort of delete bridges and split apart. So we have this approximation and then we decompose it. And then the hope would be that in many cases, maybe we don't have a lot of indecomposables here, but maybe we have a lot of approximate um, uh, summons, sorry, not indecomposables. And that we, if we first sort of do a little bit of surgery, then we can split the module apart and get a lot of simple pieces. And then we can do the, the same thing as in one parameter persistence. You know, we might have something that's easier to visualize since we have um, the pieces are, are simpler. And maybe this is better for getting fast algorithms and so on and so forth. So this would be my a sort of hope that we can do in uh, multi-persistence. And here there are a lot of questions you could ask. You could um, obviously algorithms become important here, like how do we actually compute a good approximation? How do we split the modules apart? And then there's the question of decomposition into uh, in decomposables, and there's been some work done there, but um, but there's still more to be done, and you could ask about complexity and so on. Uh, but I'm not going to talk so much about the algorithmic aspect. My focus is going to be on stability, as the title suggests, because we want still want this property that when we go from a module to this approximate decomposition, that this is a stable prop. Um, uh, operation. So that's going to be the, the question of the talk. Do we have stability here? And actually just making sense of what stability means here is going to be a non-trivial question. So let's look at some examples and see what uh, definitions we could try to come up with or to get some ideas. So here we have the same example as before. And now we want to somehow as before, try to delete these bridges. So do we have some sort of operation that deletes bridges? And there is a, such an operation, namely erosion. Now, if you go to the literature, then you will find some papers on the erosion distance. Um, I wasn't actually able to find a definition of erosion as I knew it. I think that's probably folklore. Um, in any case, there definition is in the paper. I don't claim that I came up with this. Uh, seems to be an uh, idea that's floating around, but maybe it hasn't been written down. But in any case, what, what you do when you erode a module is essentially that you first identify the pieces of a module that's uh, about to die or has just been born. And then you somehow delete these parts of the module by either taking a quotient of the module or you take a sub-module. And then you're left with what is the erosion of a module. And this depends on a parameter epsilon. If epsilon is zero, then you do nothing. You just get back the module you started with. And if, erosion, uh, if epsilon is big, then you might erode away even the whole module in the end and just get zero. So if you apply this erosion um, procedure to these two modules, then you get rid of the bridges and you're left with these three pieces and you can find a good matching as before. So based on just this example, um, eroding and then try to match it, try to match uh, seems like a good idea. But unfortunately, there are examples where this doesn't work. Um, here we have a slightly more complicated example. On the left, we have a module A that's just two copies of the square. So that's simple enough. But on the right, we have B, which is a module which is um, roughly, which is similar to A, so it's epsilon interleaved with A for some small epsilon. But in the top right corner, we have this tiny piece that essentially glues together the two um, rectangles. And this makes B indecomposable. So now we could try to uh, apply erosion again, and we could hope that this square disappears. So the module split apart and we can again match with the indecomposables uh, summons of A. 
But unfortunately, what happens if we apply erosion is that B just shrinks. It doesn't split into two um, because this, this square that glues together the two components just moves. It doesn't disappear. So this idea doesn't work, but we see that if we look at B, if we could just erode away somehow the top right corner and nothing else, then we would be good. So the next idea would be to do some sort of selective erosion. So now I've just removed this square and now I have a module B that is um, a direct sum of two modules. Um, and these are both similar to this square. So now we have a good matching. So here it looks like the, the solution is to do some sort of selective erosion, which might depend on, um, on uh, what the modules exactly look at, uh, look like. Um, so this is the idea that we're gonna use. And based on this, we define the epsilon erosion neighborhood of A. And essentially this neighborhood is the set of modules that lies between A and its epsilon erosion somehow. So you might not have eroded it completely. You might have eroded just some parts. Um, now, formally, this is um, a module is in the epsilon erosion neighborhood if it's a quotient A1 over A2, where A1 is almost all of A. So it sits between this epsilon image, which I haven't defined and I won't define, but it's for epsilon small, this is almost all of A. And A2 is almost zero. So it's less than this epsilon kernel, which I also haven't defined. Um, so the point is that this is a quotient that's almost all of A modded out by almost nothing. Um, and you can actually prove that this um, erosion neighborhood only contains modules that are epsilon interleaved with A. And you can also prove that uh, a sort of approximate converse holds that if A and B are epsilon interleaved, then their erosion neighbor or epsilon erosion neighborhoods um, actually intersects. Um, right, so we want to use this erosion neighborhood to define some sort of approximate uh, matching between modules. So here we have two modules A and B, and we decompose them into these indecomposables. So these are the, the barcodes of A and B. And remember that we can't just match these barcodes um, immediately because uh, there might not be a good matching even if A and B are similar. So what we do first is that we pick modules in the erosion neighborhoods of A and B. And this way we might have some summons that are split apart as we saw in the previous examples. And then we try to look for a matching. Um, and actually when we do this process, we can skip the matching step. We can just um, sort of erode them to the same module. Um, Ask now, a question. Sorry. Yeah. Is it correct or morally correct to say that when you erode a module, like a large and decomposable can split into smaller pieces, but you don't have the opposite? Um, yes, uh, that's true for erosion, but uh, you're anticipating my next slide, <laughs> which is that um, we can have exactly the problem that you're hinting at here. Namely that if you pick just any module in the epsilon neighborhood of A, it could happen that you glue together um, some indecomposables. And that's not what we want here, because if you have two modules and I look for what's sort of morally a matching, then if you just glue together everything, which might happen in some cases, and then you have one piece and one piece and you just match them together, this is not what we want to allow. Um, so we want to, um, actually, we don't want to work directly with this erosion neighborhood definition when we define these approximate matching. What we want is to use uh, epsilon refinements. And this is um, essentially just saying that we're not allo allowed to pick any module in the erosion neighborhood of A. We have to pick, we have to um, look at the barcode of A and erode, uh, pick a, a module in each uh, erosion neighborhood of each, the, the, each summon. And then we take the sum of that. And then we have, um, 
exactly what we wanted um, from here, namely that you can split up some indecomposables, but it's impossible to glue them together. And this is the notion of uh, stabilized epsilon matching that uh, we want. So this um, uh, stable of our notion of stabilized uh, epsilon matching is simply a module that's an epsilon refinement of A and B at the same time. Um, right, so now we've done you know, a lot of work and a lot of thinking to reach this definition. Um, and all we've really done is to make this intuition we've had mathematic mathematically precise so we can now ask an actual mathematical question and when I was working on this it was similar it took me a lot of time to just get to the point where I knew which um, theorem I wanted to prove to get the to the right definition so that's uh, um, it's very easy to come up with some definition that seems reasonable but ends up being either uh, like the the conjecture ends up being either false or uninteresting um, but okay, so now we have the definition we want. So we want to show that if we have two similar modules, then we can always find a, a stabilized matching, which um, is a common refinement. Um, right. And one might hope here that if you have an epsilon, ma epsilon matching, then you could find uh, an epsilon refinement. Unfortunately, it's not that nice. You can't even, in general, find uh, a C epsilon refinement for a, a constant C. But we do have a stability theorem here, which is the, the main theorem of the talk, you could say, or of the paper. So first, we need a definition. Uh, the soup dim of A is, well, if it's finite, it's just a maximal uh, de um, dimension of A, and we're only interested in this finite case. So then this uh, stability theorem says that if we have two modules A and B that are epsilon interleaved and pointwise finite dimensional, and we let R be the soup dim of A, so the maximal dimension of A, then A and B have a common to R epsilon refinement. So that's the... Um, that's exactly the kind of stability theorem we wanted. We have an epsilon interleaving and it gives us a, a, a two R epsilon refinement or approximate two R epsilon matching if you want. Um, now you see this, this R here, it looks slightly random and arbitrary, but it turns out that it's actually necessary because there is a complicated counterexample which shows that if you try to replace this two here by a better constant, so a constant of less than one fourth, then the, the theorem just fails. It's not true anymore. So you, you really need this, um, this R here. Um, right, so I wanted to just give a brief idea of how to prove this theorem without going into too much detail. So what we start with is the only thing we have, namely an epsilon interleaving, which is this um, pair of maps phi and psi from well, minus epsilon shift of A to B to an epsilon shift of A. And what we know is that the, the composition of the maps is almost the identity. Um, and the first thing we do, the first step of the proof is to replace these modules with uh, refinements of A and B. So the shifts of, epsilon, uh, of A are replaced by a refinement of A and B is replaced by a refinement of B. And in changing the modules, we also change the morphisms a little bit or take the induced morphisms we get from phi and psi. Um, and we want to do this in a way such that the composition is no longer approximately the identity, it's actually the identity. Because when we have this, we can apply the splitting lemma. Now, the splitting lemma says that if we have this situation where the composition is the identity, then the middle term here, B prime, is isomorphic to the direct sum of A prime and the kernel of Psi prime. And um, since Psi prime is induced by an interleaving morphism, its kernel should be small. 
like very broadly speaking. So what we want to do next is to just remove the kernel of a psi prime from B prime so that we're left with just A prime in the middle here too. Um, and again, we want to do this in a way that preserves this uh, refinement property. And if we manage to do that, then we end up with this um, with this module A prime everywhere, and it's um, going to be a refinement of both A and B, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, now, both of these steps are complicated because we need always need to preserve this direct sum to avoid this problem of gluing things together. And that's uh, essentially what makes uh, the proof difficult and technical. But this is the sort of rough outline of the proof. And I don't think you want more technical detail than that for now. So <laughs> um, I'll, uh, uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, now this, uh, as I said earlier, this theorem is impossible to improve or to better buy more than a constant of, what was it, roughly eight. Um, and I think that in the case where the modules are uh, direct sum, sums of um, not, uh, sorry, they, the barcodes don't have too many um, elements. So they're direct sums of these few big pieces. Then I think this, um, Theorem is essentially the final answer. But there is also the case where you have some big module that's uh, a, a direct sum or almost a direct sum of many uh, low dimensional modules. And in that case, I think there is room for improvement in this theorem. So I conjecture the following, which is that, um, uh, that you have almost the same theorem as before, but where I replaced R, which was the maximal dimension of A, with the maximal dimension of any summand of A. So if A is just indecomposable, then this is exactly the same. But if A is a direct sum of many, let's say, pointwise one-dimensional modules, then these two Rs can be very different. And then this conjecture here could be a very, it could be a much stronger statement than uh, the theorem. Um, and I think this conjecture is particularly interesting because um, when I talked about this pipeline earlier, I was, you know, there are some cases where you have a big module that's just impossible to approximately decompose or anything. But what's maybe more interesting is when you have these um, modules that are essentially just many small dimensional modules on top of each other and you want to split them apart. And that's exactly the, the setting where you get a stronger statement here. So I think proving this uh, conjecture uh, would be very interesting. And there's another reason why I'm interested in this conjecture, which is that you have a corollary for a set of um, so-called upset decomposable modules. So an upset module looks like this. You have, you can imagine in the two parameter setting that you have this curve and then the module is supported on everything above the curve. And in that uh, region, it's just one dimensional with the identity morphisms, very simple. And then an upset decomposable module is simply a direct sum of um, such upset modules. And if this conjecture is true, then for this, um, for such modules, you have a, a very strong um, stability result, namely that if two modules are epsilon interleaved, then you have a C epsilon matching between their barcodes. So you don't have to talk about refinements or anything. You, you have a C epsilon matching on the nose. Um, now, I, I know that this conjecture or this corollary is false for C less than three, but for C equals three, it's um, open. And this... Um, this corollary is interesting me, to me because, um, I mean, first of all, it shows up in, in some questions in earlier work that I've been doing. So I've been looking at similar stuff for, for years now. Uh, but in particular, it, they show up in um, the proof of MP hardness of computing the interleaving distance, which was uh, some work that I did with Magnus Botnan and Michael uh, Kerba. 
um, because in that paper we worked with exactly these uh, upset decomposable modules or staircase decomposable modules as we call them that's a slight special case and we showed that so we, we showed that um, c approximating the inner leaving distance for c less than three is mp hard and we showed that in this specific case of these upset decomposable modules and the question of whether this MP hardness result can be strengthened for a larger constant. So C approximating it for general C is um, closely connected with this conjecture. So if this uh, conjecture is true for C equals three, then our approach from that paper is hopeless already in the um, C equals three um, setting. So then you might ask, uh, so in that case, the inner leaving distance is uh, you can three approximate it for upset decomposable modules uh, in polynomial time. And then you can start your, well, since this, um, this problem is MP hard for less than three and polynomial for greater than three in this specific setting, maybe that's the case for general modules. So maybe you can find a polynomial time algorithm for approximating the inner leaving distance in general. On the other hand, if this conjecture is false, then maybe the method from our paper can be applied to show MP hardness of any approximation of the inner leaving distance. So there are some connections here between, um, between this stability conjecture and uh, hardness of computing the inner leaving distance. And a second application of this um, corollary or potential application has to do with some, uh, I should say, a recent trend in uh, multi-parameter persistence of um, approximating modules uh, or using relative homological algebra to approximate uh, modules. So the idea is that you're given a module which might be very complicated, and then you want to simplify it a bit by somehow approximating it with simpler modules. So these might be rectangle modules or uh, upset decomposable modules or hook modules or um, these uh, one-dimensional uh, or modules that decompose into these one-dimensional things. And in this work that has been done here, there is also the question of stability because you have a module and then you get some representation and you want to know if if you start with two diff uh, similar modules, will you get similar represent representations? And again, uh, the questions that you have to answer there is very similar to this um, this conjecture, um, right? And I think this upset decomposable case is, um, in a way, like if you can solve this case, then a lot of the other cases that show up in this logical algebra setting, um, they should be easier somehow. Though it's not a direct implication. Um, all right, so these are some uh, applications of the this conjecture. And yeah, I see that I have a lot of time, um, but I'll just finish by mentioning a bit of future work. So one thing is to just prove the conjectures. Um, they seem hard to me. I spent some time trying to prove this uh, stability of absolute decomposable modules and I've kind of given up at this point, so I'm not sure if I'm going to recommend people to work on it since it seems hard, but if someone could could prove it, then I'd be very happy to see that. And the second thing that I want to mention is to find a decomposition algorithm for um, that somehow improves on the, the state of the art, which I think is um, this paper by Dane and uh, Chin on decomposing multi-parameter persistence modules um, because they can guarantee a complete decomposition of, two, of a, a module if all the generators and relations are distinctly graded. But um, in this setting, when we want this approximate decompositions, then um, I think what makes sense to do is to take a module and somehow group together the generators and relations and put them on the same point and then try to decompose. I think that's the kind of thing you would want to do to make them decompose as much as possible, which is our goal. 
And that's exactly the setting when um, this work doesn't give you uh, a complete decomposition in general. So I would be interested in seeing um, if we can improve on this work to get uh, complete decomposition in general. And um, of course, to, to do this as fast as possible. Um, all right, that's uh, all I had. Thank you. Thanks so much. So before we get to questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves and applaud for the speaker. All right, so questions for Hovar? I'll start with one. So this uh, corollary of the conjecture, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but it, it's known that corollary is false if you try to use a constant that, that's less than three. Yeah. Um... That's um, I think the example or one example you can use to show that is in uh, the first paper I wrote. It's not exactly about uh, that, that's a statement about rectangle decomposable modules and not upset decomposable modules. But um, there is a, a sort of maybe not obvious but straightforward way to get from that example or write that example as a, an example of uh, upset decomposable modules. Mm -hmm. And also the, the modules that we work uh, with in the MP hardness um, paper, um, they also, I mean, if, if we, you hadn't had this, um, if, if you hadn't had a counter example for C less than three for those, then there would be nothing hard about it, to put it like that. So the, the module that we construct in there also um, contradicts this for C less than three. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Hi, do you hear me now? No. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Um, well, thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about like, um, so I guess my question is if you have any theoretical guarantee that this way of approximating your modules is the way in which you have to do it in order to obtain a matching, like is this the only way or the best way to do it? Because the way like um, I understood it and maybe I'm missing something, um, it really solved this problem of having like um, two squares that were connected or the other example that you gave us. But I am I was wondering if there might be any other like pathological um, behavior that prevents you from having a matching that this erosion refinement doesn't solve. So yeah, I think that's my question, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure I understood that correctly. Um, I mean, there are, the theorem sort of says that this deals with all of the, of the problems. So you can always find a, a good matching up to this uh, CR factor. Okay, um, so like, yeah. So I guess it does cover all the, all the problems, even though, yeah, okay. Okay, then I guess, yeah. Then I guess that's, that's the answer, yeah. I mean, it doesn't, there is this factor of, of R, which um, which sort of means when, when you have a lot of dimensions to play with, then you can um, grow the problem and make it more difficult to deal with. And I this sort of shows up in the, the counter example that shows the approximate tightness of the main result. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good intuitive way to explain it though. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, there, there is some complicated or confusing algebra to deal with. 
Okay. Uh, it's not just, you know, you have a bridge and then you delete the bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess. And also, like, maybe related to that parameter R, which only depended on A, right? Is, is I guess, this, like, the fact that it does, it only depends on A, even though the, like, the statement of your theorem concerns A and B and it should be symmetric for them. It's because if they're interleaved, their sub theme are related, like, are the same or something like that? Um, like, yeah. Yeah, that's a little funny in the statement because okay. uh, I mean, the this R could be different. Um, in particular, B. like in B, you could have just this um, uh, this summoned or a set of summons that's supported on a, a tiny area which has a huge dimension and okay. doesn't play a role because it's not persistent. Okay. So it could be very different. So in that case, I guess you just choose the the A or the, the module with the lowest star and, and use that. But the, uh, the asymmetry, uh, I think, comes from the way I set up the proof that I only consider one composition of phi and psi. I don't consider both of them. And yeah. Yeah, so the, but anyway, it should be symmetric, right? Like you could just choose the other one. If, like you can choose the best one. Yeah, exactly. OK, I see. OK, thank you. So, so you don't actually need an interleaving for your proof. You only only need sort of. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, one-sided interleaving. Uh, um, like one composition needs to be the identity, but maybe not necessarily the other. Yeah, I think you. So one one composition is. Uh, how does it go? Yeah, if you have just the one side of inter interleaving, then I think that's actually another part of the theorem, which I didn't talk about here. Then you have essentially, in the end, you get that the barcode of the refinement of A is a subset of the barcode of the refinement of B. But then to get this theorem, or this theorem, um, you also need this kernel of psi prime to be small. Uh, that's the kind of set here. And that's where the other um, composition comes into the picture in a more indirect way. I see. I see. Further questions? So, so I want to ask another question about this constant C. Um, Okay, so it's known that C can't be less than three. And there, there seem to be sort of like qualitative consequences. Let's say this conjecture is true with some value of C. There seem to be like qualitative differences. Like if you could get away with C equals three, maybe some proof would be easier or harder. You know, are, are, there, are there other values of C that might have qualitative differences in, in what you can prove or not? Or, or see, uh, or, or how, do, how do these qualitative differences come up just based on the value of a constant, I, I suppose? Um, I don't really know. Like the, for the, the corollary, you somehow get more leeway for a larger C, um, but there doesn't seem to be a clear way to take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, there is a, there's a clear difference between one and three, and then between three and five. Or so the the odd numbers are somehow the relevant here. But, oh, so there is a difference if if this constant is less than five or greater than five, if, if it exists. Um, I think this, if this conjecture is true for some, from some c and upwards, then I think that would have to be an odd number. Um, at least it would surprise me a lot if it wasn't, and maybe I can even prove that it has to be an odd number. I mean, I don't. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I, think, I think it has to be an odd number, actually. I see. If, if there's such a C, then the infimum of all such C for which this is true is, is going to be an odd integer. Interesting. Yeah, I think so. Or infinity. Okay. Any intuition for why odd? 
Um, it has to do with, so if you have an interleaving, then that you can think of the maps as moving forward by one. And then somehow, if you go just directly to from A to B, then that's one step forward. And if you go a little further, then the next time you get to B, it's three steps or five steps and seven and so on. So that's um, the origin of this uh, odd number pattern. Cool, that makes sense. That's nice. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, let me uh, end the recording here. <laughs>